Thank you for your interest. Thanks for joining us. You see the different generations between us. Here's an iPhone, I have a watch. That's true. <laughs> now, before I introduce you, the fellow next to me, I wanted to ask him, who are you? I don't know how to answer that. Um, what, yeah, which bit do you want me to say? I'm a human, or do you like that bit? Or the... Uh, I'm um, my name, Ed Atkins. I'm not going to, I can't find the profound bit there, but did you tell me what you think I am. No, I was asking myself if there is an answer of, for this question anyway. All oh, right, yeah. I mean, there's loads of answers. Yeah. I am a human. I am. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there are loads of answers, right? And. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that one, yeah. But, but uh, is, yeah, who are you, Thomas? <laughs> I mean, I've given you a clue there, Thomas. Yeah, it's yeah. a name. Yeah. Normally we would say the name. Yeah. Yeah, but the way you asked made me think you wanted more than just the name. You yes. wanted like a... <laughs> but there's also a possibility to say, for example, what is written in a passport. Right. What, like male and my age and whatever and, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I suppose I don't have much confidence in any of the... I quite like having a name. That's quite useful. But all the other things, all the other categorical things are, are pretty disputable, you know. They could quite easily be changed. Faked. Not just fake, but like um, what one person thinks of as this categorical definition another person could dispute, I would think. Yeah. I don't, yeah. But we have to admit that the machines we deal with, the iPhone and my watch. Yeah, yeah. They have a certain knowledge who we are. Well, they don't have any knowledge, do they? I mean, the iPhone, your watch doesn't know about you, I don't think. Oh, oh smell on it. There's a lot of bacteria. Oh, right. But that's the bacteria. <laughs> that's, that's... But they are also individual in a way. The bacteria? Yeah, I think so. Do you look after them? Do you... <laughs> Is it a careful but, cultivating but, of a culture but under But actually, watch? I once read that some perfume companies, yeah, they try really to find out your personal kind of smell and yeah. then kind, kind of to counteract it with other smells, other bacteria. Yeah. So it's almost a personal yeah. Uh, signature. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's some statistic like we are 70% not human, materially. Like we're made up of mainly parasitic organisms that live on us. So you just get rid of the whole thing. So a name is good, though. It's just like a kind of um, uh, uh, non-concrete, just um, applied thing. You know, it's not, it doesn't risk that much. So the, all of the beings in front of me here are called together Thomas, and they speak as one Thomas. And this legion of, legion of stuff. Yeah. But it's not enough for you. Say again. It's not enough for you. you. You had to invent another creature. I think I know where you're going with this, but I don't... I didn't really invent... It. I didn't invent an avatar. This is not a... a hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is, but it's really... What's really important before we go down a particularly um, digital contemporary sort of avenue is to think of this as simply equivalent to uh, writing a character in a novel mm -hmm. and pouring a lot of what you know into that. You know, that it's not necessarily that different. It's just that it's attached to a lot of tech 
that could be used to, to create some sort of surrogate person that is, stands in for you. But, I'd, um, but I, would, I wouldn't say that that's what these things are doing directly about me. What would you rather say? What would who say? You rather say on there. Oh, I see. Um, that they're kind of ciphers, they're little models, you know. There's no, I'm under no illusion that they're alive in any way or real. They're just vessels which can quite carefully sort of take care of certain performances or something. Um, they, they're very purposeful. They're not, you know, like they're very much attached to doing a job. They, they're also not people. It's just that they, they yeah. I mean, if you, it's, it's like if you, if you get some cows and you start, and you know that you're going to have to kill them to eat them or something, but you start naming them, it's probably a problem because you'll get quite attached to them in some way. So I think I've tried to sort of pull back and just call them figures or something and not really give them names. Although when you buy them, they come with names. So there's, you know, all of that. I don't know. Yeah. But they're, they're quite, they, there's quite a sort of flat line of stuff in the, in the films. In terms of my interaction with them, they're, they're sort of, their role is allegorical. You know, they become like, uh, a particular figure doing a particular thing. They're only ever attached to their, their situation. They can't leave it. And there's no fantasy of, I wonder what they were like before in this film or something. You know what I mean? Like, they don't have an outside. They don't, they're not actors either. They're just, um, you know, shells, husks, costumes, whatever thing that requires um, you to occupy it in some way, to animate it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry. Um, can you describe the difference, for example, to a conventional sculptor who does a figure? Yeah. You said you're more close to a writer, or um, the figure has a relationship or is comparable to a figure that is invented by a, an author, by a writer. Uh, yeah, I mean, the process I think of as uh, making these things is closer to writing than painting or, or sculpting. I don't really know about sculpting. But also, I don't make these figures. I buy them. You know, all of the models in it, I've bought them. They're not, I didn't hand craft the pineapple that gets put in the tray. I just bought a pineapple model for really next to nothing. And a lot of them are free, or you can... Find, I mean, you know, you can find an equivalent of everything in the world uh, as a 3D model, you know, which is great because you get, it gets rid of the problem of having to invent stuff. You don't have to sculpt a pineapple or something, which seems like a ludicrously pointless thing to do. Whereas just like stuff that's already there, you start to kind of put it together into scenes. So it's kind of curatorial to a certain degree, or at least in the kind of contemporary sense of that word and arranging these things and, um, but I suppose you could argue that words have a kind of appropriative relation, you know, they already exist, I'm just plucking them and sequencing them in the right order. And potentially so more, uh, less composing than, um, than finding a grammar for it or? Yeah, or, or, or you know, like uh, finding the perfect metaphor for something. So How if you're describing so what is a metaphor? This is another... Uh, what do you, what's the... <laughs> I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, a poetic turn in the place of a kind of total literal description of something. But, it wouldn't be, but it's not analogy necessarily. Cause anal I mean, at least grammatically, analogy is like, this glass is like a tree. I mean, it's not, but you know, but the, the, the grammar, the, the words in between tell you that it's like it, that it's not it. Whereas to drop that, this tree-like glass or something would have the kind of uh, uh, full, full sort of excitement of metaphor in some way. 
But in the same way that, like, if you're describing the snow outside and you said it's like a blanket of snow, it's kind of tired and boring because that's a really familiar way to metaphorize snow on the ground. But if you've, and, and the pleasure of trying to find the right way of describing that, which conjures enough sensation and emotional kind of interest and difference and all of that. And in a way, you know, that's all writing is to a certain degree, at least on the kind of moment to moment thing. Obviously there's narratives and other broader structures and things, but similarly, like picking, picking the right thing, choosing the bolero, um, choosing an edit, all of these things. Edits feel quite close to line breaks and, um, you know, structure, at least that's, I really like writing, so, and I really like making the videos, so I've kind of presumed that they must be quite similar in some way. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that the way I write or make videos is like, uh, is a normal way to do it, or is universally equivalent writing to video making, <laughs> you know. But there, but there is, I mean, even though all of the objects are acquired, they're not made from nothing, the promise of, of CGI is of anything. You know, you could, you could make anything in this world. No restrictions. Right, there's no so physics, you become a, there's no, you become you, a god or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or at least a, a sort of... A god know, of objects. A, a bedroom god, yeah. A god of objects. Not that, yeah. What? A god of objects. Yeah, or a god yeah. of emotions in human beings yeah, as well. Yeah, or, or physics. Physics, know. okay. So you can, you, you know, um, but also of, uh, of really successful faking, fake, fakery, I suppose. You know, as a kind of high end of, of representational uh, realism or realisticness. And it's really hard, this, because I want to say verisimilitude, but that sounds awful. But actually, there must be a... And I quite like the clunkiness of realisticness, because it's ugly. But what I mean is like things that l look as close to like the thing as possible, but which do not necessarily materially resemble the thing. Whatever that word would be. Maybe there isn't a word for it. Um, but obviously CGI in the broader use, the, you know, the wealthy corporatized or, or, or kind of industrial use is as a substitute for reality and therefore recognizing it as CGI is a failure of it. You've spotted it, you've seen the fake, so it sort of unravels in front of you, whereas obviously a, a lot of this stuff is not, not meant to disappear into reality, but sit in some awkward relation to reality and to overtly artificial stuff. Yeah, and finally, what is reality then? Uh, all of it. All of it. But this must be more than the objects then. What do you mean? You, sometimes you were talking about emotions, yeah. that they are very important to you. Yeah. Objects normally do not have emotions. No. What's an object, do you think? So now you turn it. <laughs> I think it's a way to describe something uh, which is not me. So everything, everything outside of you is an object? I don't know. Every person? Or Actually, uh, when we get back to um, the question of um, grief. Grief. And grief. This is now my association. Grief and uh, melancholia. Right. And there was this text by Sigmund Freud, I guess it's 1917. Um, it's called Grief and Mel Melancholia. Mourning and Melancholia. Mourning, sorry. So in, in German it's um, oh, yeah. okay. Trauer und uh, Melancholie. And he differentiates between these two types of grieving. Mm. And in the first, in mourning, uh, we grieve a loss of a beloved person or identity and even a nation. He mentions a nation. You can grieve a nation. But um, 
there is this very important term of work of mourning, so you get over it because you know what you lost. The second term, uh, melancholia, you don't know what you lost. So it's kind of the, the, the person is un, unable to identify the reason uh, why he or she is, is grieving. And actually, and coming back to my association, actually when we are mourn, this is a sort of um, healing process. And he also gives us a framework of time, which is very kind of weird. He says within one year, one and a half year, you should come over it. And you, and that's the point now, and you replace one beloved object by another object. So you lose somebody, for example, and you replace it by another person you love. So, he would say, I, as a person, am an object if you lose me. Do you agree? I mean, yes, in as much as that's kind of useful, right? And then we can get over it. I mean, like, it's not, it's not like, can I think we that's get a semantic easy, problem, easy, not easy really right. a real one. Easy right. Do, do, you think, we, do you think we can get over it? I, does he really say that we can get over it? I feel like it's not like a kind of clear-cut thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe, would, would you want to get over it? I mean, is, where does desire sit with that kind of thing of losing someone or something that is significant to you? Surely it's a restitutive process of, of changing the, the loss into something that's not just terrible and negative, but somehow productive. That the work of mourning is to kind of, uh, is to retrieve something from, uh, and the, the danger is to think of this all very literally in some way, I think. Because I don't, I'm not sure I could, one could sort of chart and separate and think, oh, this is me retrieving this thing, or this is me getting over it, or, or even being aware of it sufficiently oneself, of like, it's been a year and a half, I'm probably fine now, or whatever, you know. Yes. So I, but I also don't, I don't, I, I don't think it's interest, interesting to think of getting over something, or, you know, better t to somehow uh, transform it. Maybe. Yeah. Do you consider your work as a means to transform it? Yes, it has been. But not only. I mean, uh, <coughs> um, I think that the, the, the other, s the melancholic side is sort of more interesting. If only because it doesn't, it's, it's just harder to grasp in some way or to think about. To think about the loss of something you don't know that you've lost. Or to even think of that lost thing as something that potentially you didn't even think was losable, you know? You didn't think it was something that could be lost. I mean, can all give, of this... Can you give an example? Well, uh, gender, I suppose, would be one. Gender melancholia is a thing. Uh, the loss of the possibility of having something that you could lose. The loss of something that, that, that was never there, you know what I mean? But you still, but potentially there's still the process of the damage of an actual loss is happening, I suppose. I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is why it's more interesting, I think, is because it's quite a hard thing to sort of think through because it necessarily is as psychological and as sort of, um, it's not a literal state. It's not something that is, I lost my leg, I miss my leg, you know, it's, it's, it's unnameable, potentially, right? But that, that potentially, but that still generates a sensation that there could still be uh, really profound and real feelings about something like that, which is exercised through um, being triggered in certain ways or, or by experiences that you keep going back to because you want that feeling again or something. Or I don't know. I mean, uh, in terms of trying to account for feelings that don't necessarily have a concrete explanation. They don't just uh, 
oh, this is what happened, and therefore I feel like this, and maybe eventually I'll get over it, or whatever. But rather sort of trapped in some uh, situation of sensation, of feeling, and um, unbalance in some way, that there isn't a kind of, um, there isn't an answer of why, but there is still, I would argue, a way to sort of feel, feel around it and sort of manipulate it and be with it or something, you know. And this has become very rare because we live in a world where you have all, for every problem in, you have a consultant and you are able, always, you know, triggered to self-optimize you in any way, mm. your muscles, your brain, your relationship, your work relation, sure. whatever, whatsoever, sure. even your op relation to your dog or to... But to be measurable or to be statistically, yeah. to statistically exist in some way yeah. and be determined as such. I'm very lucky that I, I don't have that kind of job so I can sort of maintain a, a, an ambivalence towards this and therefore also a kind of ignorance. I'm not entirely certain. I mean, as a person, obviously, um, data of me and flows through me and is, is, defines me in certain ways. Um, I suppose it's why, why there are kind of cultural forms and art forms and things that I, I really love because they don't provide answers, you know, things that don't have a conclusion or don't offer the chance of getting it. Oh, I get it now, right, right, move on, productive, this sort of relationship of solving or of even of, of the acquisition of knowledge. I understand this thing now, give me more knowledge, you know. Rather those things which afford you the, the place to, which is a difficult place, it's a frustrating place, literally, to not get it, to sort of have to live with the um, insoluble thing. Which is actually, I think, a very ethical way to be with the world. Because you're not trying to solve everything all the time. Other people trying to solve other people by prejudging them or, or going, I think you're probably like this, so fuck it, you know, I know what you are. Versus the collection of data and then trying to advise and yeah, well, contact. And, and, and data is manipulable, that's probably not a word, but you can manipulate data. Um, and, then, and if you're confusing data for people, then you can manipulate people in this way. You know what I mean, but, the, but, the, but at least the possibility of affording people their own uh, opacity, that they're not legible in some way. I don't really know what you're like, but that's not a problem for me. It's not like frustrating as a bad thing. It's a kind of, it's your inalienable right, but also symbolically it, it prevents a kind of the violence of making someone else cohere to your own thing. But, that, but I think that the lesson if there is a kind of trans, trans, transmission between the feelings around certain artworks that you don't get to have, that you don't get to understand in ways that information function or knowledge functions, then that can... Like, I like, I like teaching at art college because not to make artists or really that interested in art, but just to kind of practice ideas of paying attention to things that is not uh, normal or is not constituted as normal by society in some way. Which I suppose is a kind of queering of things, but it's also a way to allow things to not be solved according to categorical things. And in old food, this is the, the piece on floor one. Um, yeah, there, maybe there is the, the strongest feeling of that, what you were describing right now, because they are trapped in their yeah. endless, endless yeah. kind of repetition of, of mourning. Yeah, or not, not mourning, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, if, if this Did is where it get, I feel like... Can you describe it? The piece? Yeah. Well, some of it I can, yeah, the, um, that there are... The, there are nine videos, and they're 16 minutes or so. They're all synced together. Um, not much happens in them, save, save for a kind of on-off, and then a lot of um, waiting or churning or something. And there are a few characters in there. There's a baby, a boy, and a man, and they're all crying all the time. 
and then they play a piece of music together at the end, or they all play it. It's not like they're playing different parts, they're all playing this sad little cycle of chords, and then it starts again. Um, and there are the costumes. And there are loads of costumes. And texts. And loads of texts, yeah. And the texts do a pretty good job, I think, of um, providing information in a way that is not going to help you solve the work. Which I'm really, I was so excited to get them. And part of the reason to ask someone else to write, I really wanted, uh, you know, institutionally flavored wall texts to go with the work. But asking someone else to write it removed it from the kind of anxiety or the fear of me answering the work in some way. But they wrote all the wall texts without seeing the work. So it was just a, we were constantly talking, orbiting the idea of the work, but neither of us really knew what it was going to be. We knew that it, you know, that there were lots of conversations about sort of contemporary ideas of medieval stuff about paranoia and superstition, emotional um, desensitization, Game of Thrones. I mean, we just chatted about lots of things. And then, and I asked for a, uh, some from wall texts, which they'd done for me before for another show. Um, and I, the promise was I wouldn't change them at all, but that I would, I wanted to burn them into pieces of wood. Special species of wood. They are now, yeah, yeah. really special. I wonder how he feels about it, actually. Um, they're pieces of uh, the front desk, as it was, that Peter Zumpter designed. It's really gorgeous wood. So we sawed that up and then, uh, yeah, uh, seared the text into it. It was really nice. It, and it, it was kind of nice to, yeah, to use stuff from the storage here to keep it in-house, a bit like the costumes being from local, the Festspieler and the, and the local theatre, and you know, that this, um, it's sort of specificity of being attached to this place materially, you know. <clears throat> but I think that that thing was the, the kind of um, uh, unanswerable thing, which is sort of uh, played out a bit in the tears, I think, um, which are obviously gratuitous and sort of caricatures of tears. But there isn't a time before the tears for these figures. There isn't a, and there isn't a redemptive wiping away of the tears afterwards. You know, there is no narrative um, structure that will, that will solve it in some way. You know, the loop itself, and that's another thing that's become increasingly important to me is that I never let, well, don't ever want to let go of medium specificity of making digital videos, then what is it that make, constitutes a digital video that, that you could almost pull out and use as metaphor within the content of the thing? So videos are, they, they, if they're going to be installed, they have to loop. They could just sort of end and loop, but then, so what does it feel like to be in a loop? Well, how could that sort of function parabolically within the thing, you know? So, yeah. That, that it's sort of that it, it always then if it's a looping situation that doesn't really end or just repeats itself then it's a kind of purgatory or a limbo, and then if it's a if it's a purgatory then you can kind of access a lot of classical allusions to Sisyphean sort of task or something, and the kind of labour an impossible permanent labour of these things of performance, and the kind of stress and the horror of this it would be very hard to carry all of those medium. Um, <laughs> those metaphors drawn from the medium and make something lovely, I think. But yeah, this, the, the thing of um, making them cry, why do they cry? Because I made them cry. There is no answer beyond the choice to make them cry. Um, it's not that they had bad childhoods or something, or they stubbed their toe just off shot. You know, they, there is no outside for that. But how to, how to deal with the desire to to solve it, like with the, the story of the guy who fell into a sinkhole, which... And it's over. But, but the, in reality, this guy actually was swallowed by a sinkhole in Florida. This is the floor on top of it? Yeah. Uh, a piece called Hisser, the four yeah. uh, but the, he, screens. That man who went to bed one night and a hole opened up under his bed and swallowed him, 
How, how are you supposed to look at the, the reality of that and not try to solve it by interpretation? There's some fatalistic kind of, why did he, why, why? Why was he swallowed by the, why his bedroom? And they never got the body or the bed out again, you know, just fill it with concrete to stabilize the ground again. I mean, how is that not sort of suffused with uh, a really profound desire to, to understand why that happens? Anyway, I, yeah. Again, our need for me uh, metaphor. Yeah. But that's a sort of temporary solution to, to literalism or something, or as a way to re, re, uh, some slight redemption. Um. But, but coming back to old food again, um, there is some sort of an end of the loop when they all play together. Yeah. And it's somehow moderating the feeling or the strongness or the intensity of this. Yeah. Um, crying yeah because they play together yeah and also you play yeah and you play a certain piece which is very important to you yeah, yeah the piece of music is a, a short or, or potentially infinitely long piece called extended circular music number no. two by someone called Jörg Frey who is a Swiss composer um, I think he would commonly be called post minimalist but I think he wouldn't think of himself like that. He's part of a kind of group of musicians that work with, through a label and an organizing thing called Vandalweiser. And there's a lot of them and there's a lot of, and a lot of his work is actually just sort of composition room tones, you know, so barely music, barely anything. And actually these cycle of extended circular musics are quite, probably quite the most uh, melodic things he's ever written. Because they have this sort of strange, uh, essentialized, minimalized version of romanticism or impressionism. There's this, some of the chord progressions, even though they're incredibly simple, have this sort of weird um, augmentations that are just enough to make you feel, to make you feel. They feel really, really romantic, but they're only four chords and they move in such a simple way. But in playing them, and can you can you decide on the tempo, or is it written in the script? I can't the, remember what it says. The what the Latin instruction is on the score, okay. but it's you decide it for yourself. I think it's well ish. I think it's I can't remember the term, but it's uh, it's definitely encouraging you to go slow because the the tempo, the time is very important. Yeah, I mean it's 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 three three chords at a regular two beats between them, and then the the third chord and the fourth chord are. I think uh, two and a half beats or something. So there's this just this slight slippage. That's really I really advise. There's a quite a nice performance of it on YouTube. But it's really. But to play it yourself is really. And I think part of his composition of this stuff is that that, that technically it's the easiest. You know, it would be maybe one of the first things you could learn as a kid at the piano. But to play it is to be thrust into a kind of crisis with your own movements. You know, like just depressing two chord, two two notes is enough of a a potentially anxiety-ridden moment. And, and, and in fact, more so than playing something quite complicated, where you have to keep moving. But just the, if all you're doing is pressing three notes down or four notes, then and trying to have a consistency across this, it's incredibly um, challenging. If you, you take have time it seriously, to respond to your own playing, right? Yeah. There's Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, but it, it really, what it does is sort of boil down an idea of choice about, uh, and you feel the sort of connection of like, okay, I'm, my hand is moving back towards this and I'm going <laughs> to press this down now. And, it, and you can feel immediately that this is shit and this is awful and this is not what it's supposed to be. And do you consider piano, the piano pe appears in every monitor? Mm. Do you cons consider a piano a machine? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. It's an extension of your fingers, an extension yeah, maybe of your body? Yeah, it's a sort of cybernetic thing. In as much as it's an extension of what you do anyway. It's not a, it doesn't have an independent uh, robotic action or something. <laughs> Unless it's a player piano and then it's really fun, you know. You just, yeah. You know, like the, with the... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Pianola, is it called that? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And... There's another um, 
so to speak, authentic um, means you use it, it's your own voice. Mm, yeah. Is there a difference between playing music and using your own voice? Yes. I think the... Uh, when I was a kid, I had a ventriloquist dummy. And I wasn't good at ventriloquism, but I thought I was. Um, and then I got to be quite scared of the dummy. Um, and I, I had to keep him in the kitchen cupboard. And then I think I asked my mum to just get rid of him. But I didn't want him to be killed or something. It was horrible. A lot of this explains and, a lot of this stuff. what happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to him, exactly. I don't know what happened to him. So he's somewhere out there, you know, resenting me. Probably looking for me. Yeah, but does he mourn you or you no, mourn... No, he hates me. Okay. He's full of just ever seething hatred for me, I think. But maybe he knows who you are. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. Well, he knows that I can cast him aside because I, I fear him, you know. What a terrible solution to a bad relationship. Uh, but I remember trying very hard to uh, throw my voice, you know, to, uh, to be convincing. You know, the, the, the brilliant ventriloquists, it's, it's, it's sort of frightening in its, in its perfection. Even if you can see a little, a little of that, you know, there's a, it's still like, it's... Can it's you try it for us? No. <laughs> no. Um, but but, uh, but I, there's a, there was a book I, I read aspirationally, kind of young, and I didn't really follow it, and I never finished it, which is a, a cultural history of ventriloquism by someone called Stephen Connor, dumbstruck. And, and it opens with this great thing about the voice, about, um, about how the voice is this sort of the, the one idiosyncratic part of your character that leaves your body but is still recognizable as, as part of you. It's this sort of strange satellite wave that leaves you and lands in another body and vibrates a bit of that body and that, that verifies that it's you that's speaking, you know. I mean, all of this sort of material stuff, intimate, uh, is incredible, I think. And I think that that's also embedded in, in a lot of the culture of, and also in horror, you know. Possession is often most frightening in the voice. That's why, you know, in The Exorcist, when she speaks with a sort of demonic, <laughs> that voice, whatever, you know, uh, that's extra horrible. Um, or, the, you know, the, and the oracle at Delphi would speak with a god's voice, not they wouldn't look like the god, but they would be possessed by the god through the voice. Anyway, the voice has a kind of really interesting thing that we're all... Also, hearing your own voice is always fucking horrible and always weird and alienating and a kind of... It's like seeing a reflection of yourself from this angle. It's horrible, you know. All of those sorts of strange relations, self to self and also other to self and presuming of other people's interpretation of you through these things. Anyway, all of this stuff is why I, uh, not why, but it, I've started to sort of, or have been thinking about the voice in these terms and why I don't want to change it, I don't want to alter it, and why I want it to be my voice and why I want, why oftentimes it's the kind of location of the more intimate moments of the films, of singing, say, the kind of, the, the fragility of a voice as well as the confidence, declarative sort of confidence to say statements, but also to kind of fail to speak to, to, to sort of, um, like it's a sort of intensity of a kind of bodily expression, you know. My anxiety will come out here or something, you know. But also, this is true for mimics as well, isn't it? Mimics? Yeah. If you look at me and yeah. I see some sort of feeling situation, whatever, yeah. behavior in your, in your gaze, in your... Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But be because you borrow your, your voice, to yeah. the figure, yeah. And what else do you borrow to the figure from you? Uh, fac facial, facial expression? expression, yeah. Because I mean, of the same reason. Yeah, yeah, right. So yes, of course. I mean, if there is some hierarchy of uh, of a resemblance, yeah, I want those those bits that are most uh, gestural, most um, corroborative, the things that you would look to 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 sort of find humanity in someone or something, or appeal. 
where you would uh, um, where you would connect, I suppose. Yeah. So uh, all of the faces of the figures are all um, animated from my face um, using motion capture stuff. I mean, it's very crude. It's not. It's not. You know. Andy Circus or something. It's it's like me with a Kinect camera in my bedroom, you know. But it but but still the effect is there. This and for me the kind of weirdness of I'd I'd recommend it if it was easy, and it probably is now, but the the thing of uh, performing in front of a camera that then shows you back your movements on a rudimentary other face. How is that? It's great. It's really great. It's really, it's really a narcissistic kind of clinch. You're held there and you want to keep, you know, you know, it's really, it's like first discovering a mirror again or something, you know. This is me, this is me, this is me, this is me. It's great. <laughs> um, so you need to, to find out who you are. No, to a, to a, well, a bit, I suppose, as in it allows, you know, it's like if you put on a mask, at least the idea is that you're kind of liberated to a certain degree. There's a kind of anonymity to it. And putting on this and, and doing this is a bit like putting on a mask. So uh, things come out that you wouldn't necessarily have banked on, I suppose. Like, yeah. Or things that you don't really pay attention to, but then suddenly, yes, they are, all these videos are quite sad, aren't they? You know, like, it wasn't deliberate. It's not a kind of like, you know, make some really upsetting shit. You know, whatever. It's like I want to, or, or fun, you know, it's a kind of um, instinctive thing, isn't it? And then maybe it's quite surprising that you come out like that, you know, and it's slightly embarrassing and it's slightly sort of, uh, un, un, it's a strange uh, thing, yeah. Um. And happy birthday. This is on the top floor, the large screen in black and white. More yeah. gray than black and white. What? More gray. Yes, more gray, yeah. Silver. Yeah. Silver gray. Okay, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Silvery. Yeah, that's. I think that one is um, the most overtly uh, uh, personal in some way, I suppose. Or at least it felt like I knew what I was doing more, and I. And know. it is from. It's four years old. It's from. Uh, 2014. 14, yeah. yeah, and there's sometimes written 2016. So it was. Yeah, it in was the fun. It that was, was nice. Yeah. Which is now past was I know, then in the future. So it was most fun when it first when it first came out, and it was like the future, <laughs> but but in a really cheap way of just saying like June the third, 2016, or something, you know. But I think at that point I was trying to think about dates as metaphors as, uh, again, like you know, um, that you could, like you could name a date ever, right? You could say, is a date? I can't think of any. <laughs> May the twenty eighth, nineteen oh seven. Yeah, for for example, yeah, James Joyce um, had the. June 16th, 1904. Mm -hmm. This is a date he remembered because this is the date, the first date, the first uh, tete a tete with his uh, wife. And he made this date, yeah. then turned into like a. Yeah, but there's a, one the, of the uh, biggest uh, novel in history. Yeah, yeah. But the, but, but the, but the, I'm not, it's not, I'm not interested in like uh, necessarily, although there is one date in there that is significant for me, but all the others are just arbitrary. They're not. They don't mean anything at all, except of course they do. It's just that they're, they're not, not to me and not that I know it. You know what I mean? Like that the, the, actually the metaphoric content or the, or the reality of the thing is sort of embedded in it anyway. And the significance is also personal and, and subjective. So I, I might accidentally say a date that was in your... In 18th century. There's some date in the 18th century. Yeah. Yeah, I, d I don't know when it was, like June the 14th, 1825 or something, <laughs> 1825, yeah. But, it, but the, I don't know, it, I think it's also a kind of, um, dates carry some sort of weight. They feel like, oh, you know, sort of universally and, significant. And then the algorithm had, has not, you know, the, the, um, the capacity to put weight on something. Mm. Do you think so? Do you what agree? do you mean, sorry? So in terms of like, uh, what these machines do, they 
they collect data, dates. Yeah. Uh, for example, I, I'm remembered by Facebook what, you, what I did three years ago. Mm. So right. celebrate what, whatever. Yeah. Your friendship with this guy or that yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> Do they add, does that add significance to... Do you mean to, to the algorithmic gathering? It has no significance, no sense for significance. Well, I, supp I, su I suppose if it's just done to anyone at any time, I mean, like it's, if it's just happening all the time to everyone, I mean, of course it has significance, but as an act, not as a... Um, as a meaning. As a meaning, as a... <laughs> Does significance mean that I need something more than just the data, maybe a metaphor for this state? Mm. The date. Yeah. I think. Mm, I don't it's know. I mean, okay. So the other thing about dates and data and all of that, all numbers, is their their terrifying economy, right? They don't. They don't really. They, they, there's some sort of fact there, but then the sheer volume of them makes the specificity of them, I think, slightly romantic. But even even so, for numbers like um, nine billion five hundred twenty-eight million seven hundred twenty-three, it's kind of I think I missed out a few thousands in there. But you know what I mean, like the the exercise of invention in that, and of factual relation. I don't know this. I'm trying to remember why I made the video, really. But I think that that maybe it was something around that that feeling, and the br also the brute force of a date that maybe contains, that is a signifier for a significant event, an experience, but that the date itself has a cold, calculated disinterest to it. But, but it's a lot about memories, memory as well. Yeah, or the, or the lack, lack of Lack memories. of memory. Or the failure of, to remember something. So there's a lot to, I, I think of that piece as quite a kind of uh, senile in some way. Like an old person trying to remember what that meant, what was that, and and a kind of incoherent, blah, what's the, you know, I don't know. If I if I think about it kind of literally, then it, then then the black and white and the kind of um, the dates and stuff has a sort of past about it, the feeling of something once was, and maybe that once was a love or a life or something or an exchange that is no longer requited or remembered or, or has failed or something, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any questions by you? Then maybe a last one. <laughs> you can ask me what I am again. No. <laughs> you will think of it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you plague me. A lizard. <laughs> no, I think um, here in Kunsthaus Bregenz you put these four pieces together and there's a reason for this. There's lots of reasons, but, but w one of the most obvious uh, uh, joining factors is these are the... the four pieces that feature the same actor or the same model. That's one. They're also heading towards an ending for me, you know, like I, I, I'm not, I don't want to keep doing this stuff, I think. Old food being uh, pointing to a way out for me, if not for the videos, you know. Um, but You yeah. let him die. Yeah. I mean, he was never alive, though, you know. And he's not a he, either. He's just some stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, ontologically, he's more similar to a plate than he is a human. Mm. Do you need to put him away in the kitchen? I could, I'll ask my mum to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... No, I can just turn the computer off, I think. 
but I don't find them scary because I actually I have never had that nightmarish sort of switch of thinking they're real in any way at all. I just think they're quite convincing costumes. In the end, you know, it's like a, a really, really well-fitting bit of cosplay, I think. I think. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, why did you use the bolero? That's a really, thank you, that's a really, like, generous question. <laughs> um, uh, lots of reasons. So, one of the th th things I'm really into is sort of bits of music and culture that are sort of overly used in a way. They've been used so often that, that it's very hard to know what they ever were or what they could have been or, you know, that they've sort of spread so thinly around the culture. But also that it's, I'm sort of into really recognizable things, or like hopefully playing on people's presumed fluency on something, that they recognize this thing and therefore there is a kind of uh, movement towards it or like a repulsion or whatever it is, but there's an immediate re relation that I can maybe rely upon there in that familiarity. Also, the bolero was, uh, was a, a really, really radical piece of music when it was composed, you know, um, and Ravel called it a machine for orchestra, not, not a piece of music at all, but like pressing the demo button on an orchestra. Um, which I loved that. I mean, it's high modernist in that way that it's sort of... But it suited this idea of um, thinking of airport security as a kind of processing plant or something, or an abattoir, really, that it, this is a, a, a factory for processing bodies. Uh, and the bolero is definitely part of that, I think, That's, or at least is, is hysterical and kind of finally quite terrifying. Even if it ends triumphantly, it's the triumph of sort of murder or something. You know, it's not... It's not... Um, yeah, I wanted all of that stuff. I mean, also repetition, the fact that it is this kind of closed thing that just, it's almost like it repeats on top of itself. So it just gets louder and louder and more and more uh, awful. Um, and it's sort of insane, you know. People thought it, it, he was mad. And there's a, there was, I listened to something recently, or a while ago maybe, about the fact that Ravel might have been suffering from early onset Alzheimer's at the time, and that actually, one of the kind of calming strategies of Alzheimer's is repetition, and that actually the composition of this thing might have been a kind of therapeutic act in some way. But yeah. Um, and it's a dance. And it's a dance, yes. Yes. And wanting that kind of airport pastiche to be sort of alluding to a ballet of some kind, even if it's a terrible one, but the... Body, uh, choreographed bodies, I suppose. And then I guess that sort of breaking down of um, what performances are being done, you know. From the beginning, yeah. I think, uh, uh, like, a, just a lot of ideas definitely want the Bolero, definitely want airport security, definitely want dance. Or something, and maybe that, and then that everything starts to have. It also makes editing re much, much easier. The decision making, you've just got this thing. I think the decision was also, after making a lot of works that have very complicated soundtracks and a lot of different levels and movements, was to be quite brutal and think, okay, this is just the bolero. I mean, in the end, I've sort of ran out of steam, so I've edited the bolero a bit, so it's missing a couple of bars or something, or maybe like two minutes. But still, it's, you know, it was quite fun to be rigid and be locked in on this thing, this sort of carousel, yeah. Thanks. If you're saying this body of work that you're showing here is some kind of conclusion in your work, so how are you going to continue? I think, I, one, I always say that it's like, this is the last time I do work with this. Uh, because it, there's always a desire to not be the artist that does that. You know, like, the presumption that I make this kind of work annoys me, I think. But, um, but it's true, I do. I'm, I want to... Uh, the next things... I don't want to leave animation and the CGI stuff. I really like that. But I'd quite like to get rid of people for a bit, I think. So just stuff, I think. Um, 
Yeah. But then at the same time, I'd, I'd like to also push this form a bit, not using these figures, but to, but to make uh, things that take a lot longer and, 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 and I can really live with for a while. I can't really say exactly what, because I don't really know, and I'm also scared to sort of voice it out loud a bit. But um, I'm excited about it, so that's nice. And I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I've been trying to paint recently and draw and stuff, and that's been nice. Whether they're any good or not, I'm not sure, but, they're, but they, it was really nice to not be in front of a computer for a while, making things. Because you can listen to the radio when you draw, you know, it's really nice. And, you know. Yeah. Uh, writing things as well. I want to keep writing stuff. Yeah. But just picking up on that, working in different media, when you saw the jacket for the first time, did yeah. it make you think about the virtual worlds that you play in a different way? Was it strange to see this real object? It is strange. It's really strange. But it. I mean, it, but it's just sort of closing a loop. I mean, I mean the, the jacket, the, the model of the jacket that I bought for the boy to wear in the video is made up of scans of fabrics that exist in reality. So to kind of pull it back out again and make a little boy's jacket, which is a sort of m mashup of um, historical styles, um, is to sort of return it again. So it's sort of dipped, it dipped in the virtual and then taken out to dry again. So it feels like a kind of, or at least that's how I, like the, like the posters upstairs, that they're dipped in, in hisser on the bedroom wall in there and then, and then sort of the last material vestige and then put back. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, don't, I suppose I don't, I don't think of the virtual or the digital stuff as really truly in the end immaterial in any way, you know, that it's just that the material is somewhere else, you know, or it's, it's just hidden better, you know, that it's, uh, it's in the processing of, it's in the media player that's behind it in the chipset and stuff, it's miniaturized and hidden and all of this stuff, um, but that it's not, it's not bodiless or something. I'm just rambling now, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, yeah. 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 Is there any particular significance to your usage of um, the, the social media items and the uh, communication you have little pop ups or promoters in the corner and stuff that's just a split seconds in some yeah. cases? And uh, I'm quite interested to know what that where the connection is. I think I was really excited about adding that when I was making it, but I don't really like it anymore. Um, I think I quite like the idea that all of these, this, these shows could be sponsored by Facebook or something. At one point I was going to just force sponsorship. I quite like the idea of jumping ahead of the possibility of someone ever offering you sponsorship and just presuming they would. Just have Budweiser in the corner or something throughout the entire show, even though they don't know I've done that. You know, a sort of reverse theft or something or gift I don't know but I ended up only doing it a couple of times and it felt too sordid in a way but I quite liked that feeling as well so I sort of left that in there but then throughout the show there's sort of um, hollowed out versions of bits of logo and stuff like in Safe Connect these sort of slightly corporate bits of animation motion graphics kind of appear and disappear and stuff and I think I just wanted the kind of a bit of that vernacular of advertising of corporate uh, videos and news, ticker tape kind of stuff. The sensation of that, I think. Not a very good answer. But. Um, I don't really know the. I don't know what it. 
I don't know what it looks like, the scale. So I guess halfway? I don't, I mean, so what is at the top of the uncanny, or what's the end point? Is that a, what is it? Do you know? Yeah, um, photorealism is like... Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, but is it, it's only about images, it's not about other senses. It's just what it looks like. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's quite a long way down, isn't it? It's probably lower than a quite good painting, really, in the end. Because I think because it tries too hard to be quite realistic, it has that sort of like, ugh. It's very recognizably not convincing. But then at its best, I think, I think maybe if there was an uncanny valley of emotion, or of sentiment rather than image, then maybe it's quite good at, at manipulating that illusion in some way. This was a good answer. Thanks very much. No, and I don't, I, I mean, the weird thing about those, the online marketplaces of 3D models and things, I don't know who they're for. I mean, I know they're for me, but I'm, it's a very strange case to be an artist. Because if you're making movies with CGI, you don't buy them online, and Pixar don't go there and go, oh, this is cheap, I'll get that dog or something, you know. So who uses them is a kind of hobby world, like a, one of those sort of, twilight areas of the internet and of, of domestic use of computing, I think, which is quite exciting. It's, it's sort of slightly illicit, a bit sordid. Most of the bodies are quite pneumatic. Uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a, I mean, and obviously because it's sort of teenage and a bit teenage boy, I mean, most of them, there's a high proportion of guns and swords and armor and stuff that you can get. Um, but really, you can find anything, anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think that they're they're very unimaginatively designed. You know, they're kind of as as examples of human bodies or faces and something. They're pretty banal. They're very featureless in some ways, which is, I guess, the point, is that they're kind of vessels on to, into which you can pour a lot of desire or you can customize or um, ch change in any way. So they have this sort of, um, you know, seeming f flatness about them, which is obviously not true about that being a kind of flat, flattened identity. But I think that, I think, you know, so for me it was just, I'll just get the, the the best one I can get, and always trying to stay updated on that. And I think this, this, the adult male figure, they're almost all white. That's another thing to know about that world. Also, the, a lot of the technologies involved in this stuff um, are kind of structurally racist in ways. It's interesting, like the, the motion capture stuff is, works really well with pale skin, but doesn't really recognize the motion of... Uh, so it's, there's an embedded... Also, therefore, using these uh, marketplaces and sort of getting deeper into them. There's one called TurboSquid.com that's the best one. But it's, really, it's a really strange world. Because, again, I don't know who else is using these things and for what, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's try it. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Now the kids are coming. <laughs> they actually did masks. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my God. So thank you so much. It was brilliant as ever. <laughs> <laughs>